Good morning and welcome to the fourth webinar on electrifying school buses. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday and we hope you have a, a great time on this webinar and this webinar is engaging to you all. Attendees, please be sure to submit your questions through the attendee chat. We will be sending out our webinar slides and the recording of this webinar, uh, the webinar after the presentation today. If you are having any connectivity issue here in the webinar or seeing the slides, we ask that you please allow access to the webcam and your microphone for the site and refresh the page. And that should, that trick should work if you're having any connectivity issues. Introduction to Forth. Forth, we are a nonprofit trade association advocating for smart transportation. We are working in four main focus areas, which are industry growth and development, policy advocacy, consumer engagement, and demonstration and pilot projects. We have over 190 members throughout the world, and we hope if you want to find more information about our membership, our work, and uh, potential partnership opportunities, please find us at fourthmobility.org. And June 15th through the 19th, we'll be hosting five engaging webinars um, for our roadmap webinar series. We have June 15th, Equitable Transportation Electrification. Our sponsor is Puget Sound Energy. On June 16th, we'll be focusing on consumer engagement and EV adoption. June 17th, Cities Leading the Transportation Electrification Charge with our sponsor, ABB. June 18th, Charging Heavy Duty Electric Vehicles, I'll sponsor ABB as well. And then finally, we'll cover electrifying TNCs on June 19th. We hope you can join us for one or more of these webinars. And the National E-Mobility Equity Conference will be taking place in November on November 20th, 2020 at the Oregon Convention Center. This is a partnership with our EV Noir and Ford to bring equity to the forefront of the discussion where we discuss transportation electrification. And our moderator today is Kelly Yurick. She is a program manager at Forth, and I will pass it now to Kelly. We'll introduce our speaker, give us a brief outline of the conversation today. Kelly. Great, thank you, Symbiot. As Symbiot said, my name is Kelly Yurick. I'm a program manager at Forth, and I'm only going to spe be speaking for just a couple of minutes here before I turn it over to our speakers. So, just to give us a brief outline, um, so I'll be highlighting, you know, kind of setting the stage for this webinar of why electric school buses are an important topic to be talking about, um, and then I'll turn it over to our speakers to cover the ecosystem supporting electric school buses. Uh, today, how companies are responding to COVID-19, and the Center for Transportation and the Environment's Zero Emission Bus Project. All right, so to set the stage here, so why electric school buses? There are 480,000 school buses nationwide, which is eight times the number of transit buses in our country. Uh, they create access to education for almost half of the nation's children. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, they're mostly diesel operated vehicles right now. And diesel exhaust has been linked to several health, serious health risks, including increased rates of respiratory illnesses and cancer. Uh, diesel exhaust is internationally recognized as a cancer causing agent and classified as a likely, likely carcinogen by the US Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, there's a significant amount of research that shows that non-white and low-income students are more likely to rely on school buses for transportation to school. Reducing pollution associated with transportation to school for those students is critically important and can also have compounded impacts for the broader community. Um, so electric school buses can um, provide health benefits, not only for the children, but for um, their surrounding communities and of course the broader planet that we find ourselves on. Um, and then finally, just another point here, um, battery powered electric buses can reduce the environmental and health threats posed by diesel buses while also providing a reliable and cost-effective option for cities and school districts. Because they require less maintenance and run on cheaper fuel, that being electricity, electric 
vehicles and therefore electric school buses have a lower, lower total cost of ownership, even when taking into consideration their higher initial price tag. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to our first speaker. Uh, Kubo Shipyorsky is the director of alternative, alternative fuels at Bluebird Corporation. Kubo leads the business development, market strategy, and product deployment for Bluebird's propane, gasoline, CNG, and electric school buses. Bluebird is the industry leader in alternative fuel school buses with over 20,000 units deployed in over 900 school districts across North America. Kubo has been with Bluebird since 2016 and has held positions as regional alternative fuels manager and regional sales manager. Before coming to Bluebird, Kuba managed school bus sales at the Bluebird dealer in Virginia. Kuba lives in Virginia with his wife and two daughters. Kuba, I'll let you take it from there. All right, Kelly, thank you very much. Um, thank you to Symbiot and every everyone at Fourth uh, Mobility for, for hosting this really important conversation. So thank you. Um, so as, as Kelly mentioned, my name is Kuba Shipyorsky. I'm Director of Alternative Fuels for Bluebird Corporation. And we're here to talk a little bit about our newest technology, the electric school bus. <clears throat> so first I wanted to start by showing you a, a bit of a timeline of where Bluebird has come from and sort of where we're heading um, with alternative fuels and this new EV technology. So Bluebird's ideals really uh, uh, for a cleaner transportation for our children has remained prominent through our years. And, and we're now really taking this these ideals to the next level with our electric offering. So we as manufacturers of school buses really have a responsibility to our passengers. Um, as Kelly mentioned, for all those, those health reasons, you know, we, we have a responsibility to really provide them the cleanest and safest mode of transportation out there. And especially with the current state of affairs, you know, there's an increased focus on health, safety, cleanliness, and, and obviously environment. And Bluebird is excited as we have really recently hit 50% um, production in our low emissions alternative fuel school buses. So that includes propane, electric, CNG, um, all those fuel types. So we're really excited about that. So uh, Bluebird was a pioneer. Um, we came out, uh, we were the, really the first to embrace um, electric and uh, propane technology back in the day. So 1992, we introduced our first propane bus. Uh, this was a vapor system bus. Uh, since then, we have really graduated to our liquid injected system bus, which you see on the road today with our partner Roush. Uh, in 1994, we came out with our first electric bus, and that was a collaboration with Westinghouse Electronic Systems. And then in 1996, we collaborated with Electrosource to uh, produce a transit-style electric bus for the Atlantic Summer Olympics. And fast forward till today, 2017, uh, we launched our newest and latest iteration of Bluebird EV buses in the Type C and D format at STN in Reno in July. So we're really excited about the strides we've made over the years towards uh, cleaner transportation. So um, a lot of you may ask, you know, why electric school buses? How how is this how is this viable in the current market? So, you know, I wanted to, especially since you know these these buses are can be over three times more expensive than than a diesel bus. So um, I really wanted to touch first on, on, on grant funds. You know, to be frank, a huge reason for the adoption of electric school buses is funding availability. So we would really not be where we are today with the amount of electric buses on the road without organizations like the organizations in California and other states, including VW and all the states that have really realized the need for cleaner transportation and, and have allocated the funds to make that possible. Zero emissions, you know, that's obviously a hot button issue. You know, the passengers that ride our buses are most prone to the effects of harmful emissions. Um, you know, there's a constant pressure to reduce the emissions on buses. And really, that has been our primary focus at Bluebird. Uh, reduced maintenance on these buses. So we're looking at about 50 parts that are serviceable on an electric bus versus about 2,000 on a diesel bus. So that translate to to, that translates to big, uh, big costs, uh, big uh, cost savings in parts and labor. And then uh, vehicle to grid, that's really a new technology, a developing technology um, in the school bus realm. So um, 
we're, with V to G, we're really starting to realize that these buses, you know, can play another role outside of being a school bus. You know, they can generate revenue back to a district. Um, they can uh, they can uh, be used as a power source for schools, buildings. They can uh, refill stable power sources, things like that. So this is the most versatile bus model that we have seen in our history, from from the V to G to carrying kids to to all the other uh, ancillary um, uh, benefits that we can get from these these electric buses. Uh, temperature temperature control is obviously important. Um, you know, batteries are relatively sensitive. Um, we do have um, uh, we can use these buses in various climates. You know, it's it's um, from from the colder climates to to the warmer climates, and it's really thanks to the thermal management systems that we have installed in these buses that actually help it to um, to uh, function at their uh, maximum efficiency. And now there's a there's a wide availability of service and support to our customers, um, you know, from our uh, Bluebird dealer network uh, to our Cummins uh, dealer network. Cummins is our powertrain partner on the electric school buses. So now our customers can really take the relationship that they've had with the Bluebird dealer and their local Cummins dealer on the diesel side and really translate it over to the electric side as well. So if you really take a look at all these things together that I mentioned, you know, the grant funds, the V to G, the maintenance, you know, that TCO message, although the bus is expensive, that TCO message really starts to make sense for certain districts. So I mentioned reduced maintenance on that previous slide. So this slide will give you a better idea of, of the maintenance required on a diesel bus versus an electric bus. And we sort of use the, the Cummins ISB example in this one. So with the, with the diesel powertrain, a Cummins ISB you know, requires about 15 quarts of oil, if not more, and a new filter every six months. The Sumo motor that we use on our buses and our competitors use in their buses as well does, doesn't uh, require any lubricating oil. It just requires some hardware to be torqued uh, every year. Uh, on the diesel side, uh, you obviously have the Allison transmission. You have to replace a filter every 50,000 miles and fluid every 48 months. Um, there's no transmission on our uh, electric buses, so no, nothing to worry about there. Um, the fuel system on a diesel bus, um, you know, has a primary filter or water separator need to be serviced every six months. No fuel on this bus, therefore no fuel filters. Uh, and the exhaust system on a diesel bus, we know that causes a lot of headaches. The after, uh, the after treatment system, the DEF filter, the DEF tank head, I mean, the, having to fill it up with DEF every day. The electric buses don't have any exhaust, therefore they don't have an exhaust system. So that's a whole lot of savings there um, just in that part alone. Um, and the air intake filter, you know, about every 12,000 miles to 12 months and electric does not require uh, an air filter. So now you can sort of see the beginning of why certain electric bus customers are saying, you know, they're, they're, re they're, uh, they're reducing their maintenance costs by about 80% by going to electric. So then again, looking back at that TCO message, that's starting to recoup some of that money that was uh, actually paid for that, uh, that electric bus. So I also mentioned V to G on the previous slide, you know, uh, V to G creates some new opportunities, you know, it creates opportunities to buy back storage for, uh, so the utility can buy back storage from uh, the buses when they're not using it. Um, it also creates the ability to redirect the power to, to you know, a, a building, a, a fuel island, um, you know, a stable power source, things like that. And it's really opened up uh, avenues for funding sources that we have never seen in the school bus model before, and that's with utilities. So we have seen various utility school bus projects, you know, pop up across the nation, uh, and we expect to see many more pop up as this as this uh, new technology continues to develop. Uh, and this last slide here, um, you know, because of all the things I've previously mentioned, you know. We've been off to a pretty great start with our Type C and Type D EV products. We've now sold to about 12 states. 
all who have you know opened up considerable funding uh, for for electric buses. We're out there promoting this um, into other states, you know, with VW, just to make sure that these states know that the product is is you know on the horizon and 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 to really put as much money as they can towards this new clean technology. And to give you a better idea of numbers, you know, we we delivered our first uh, bus in 2018, and we delivered our hundredth bus in uh, April of 2020. So about 20 months we've delivered 100 buses. So that really gives you a good idea of, you know, how people are really embracing this new clean technology. So, you know, that's 100 more buses on which our, our kids can enjoy clean air with zero emissions. And, and we're excited, you know, where this market is going and that all, you know, all competitors are involved in this. All manufacturers are involved in, in, in try to make our uh, student transportation as clean as it can be. So uh, thank you very much. That is my last slide, actually, and happy to answer any questions after after the presentations. Thank you, Kuba. And I see we've already got a wealth of questions coming in through the chat feature. Um, keep those coming. We'll be uh, opening up the panel for questions at the end of all of our presentations. So. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to our next speaker, Mark Childers, who's the manager of powertrain and technology sales for Thomas Built Buses. He's responsible for strategic growth of all powertrain solutions across Thomas product lines. Thomas product lines. In the past two years, the exciting development of Thomas's electric C2 Julie has been a key focus. Additionally, he supports sales of new emerging school bus technologies through Thomas's outstanding dealer network. Prior to his current role, Mark was the customer support manager at Thomas for six years, leading activities to support customers in the aftermarket. Mark has also held key roles in business development, sales, and operational management with another major truck OEM. Mark has an undergraduate finance degree from Appalachian State University and an MBA from Elon University. Mark? And un unmute yourself, Mark. There we go. Sorry, Kelly. So, um, so first of all, thank you for um, to Fourth Mobility and Kelly and Symbia for for hosting this afternoon and for putting this webinar together. Uh, we're excited to be a part of that, and uh, I think when. Uh, when I go through my slides, you'll see a very common theme from what Cuba shared earlier about Bluebird strategy. Uh, much of the technology is similar, and um, I think we're both very excited about this new technology entering into the school bus market and sharing some information with you this afternoon. So um, what I'd like to do next is to just to give you an idea of where we are as, as an organization with Thomas. We're part of the Daimler Group. And uh, I think one of the questions that may be asked is why electric school buses? And uh, to answer that, I think there's a much larger global uh, answer to that. And that is globally, commercial vehicles are being electrified around the world. And one of the um, important strategies of Daimler is to electrify our entire portfolio of commercial vehicles, of which Thomas is a part of. And we're very fortunate to have the ability to leverage our technology coming from not just the school bus side, but also from commercial vehicles. Each one of those products that you see on the screen there has been electrified in North America, and we are in, engaged in numerous projects to grow the electric market in the commercial space. But let's talk a little bit about um, the school bus here and why electrification. So this slide here I want to share with this group. Whoops. Let me go back. Uh, this comes from National Renewable Energy Labs. And this kind of gives you a picture of the forecast for uh, transportation and 
in terms of the electricity consumption that is being forecast for you know, the next, say, 30 years. And you can see from this graph here that um, transportation uh, development in electric vehicles is a significant uh, component of growth in the next 30 years. And that is one reason not only uh, Daimler and Thomas is engaged in electrification of our product portfolio. And uh, it also just kind of begins to kind of highlight the growth of this market, not just from a vehicle standpoint, but also from a support standpoint, from um, charger infrastructure that's coming online into this market space to dealers now having to kind of pivot a little bit and change some of their thinking on technicians training about electric vehicles. So the entire industry in transportation is starting to pivot and to begin to see this electrification and transportation growth come online. This next slide talks about an ecosystem around an electric vehicle. And um, when you look at the ecosystem around the vehicle, there's lots of different functions that have to support uh, the introduction and, and deployment of an electric vehicle. And we see this ecosystem around the, the electric school bus, Julie, uh, as important for helping customers and school districts kind of walk through the journey of what does it look like to make that transition from uh, having 100% um, either diesel or alternative fuels uh, to electrification of, of their fleet. And you can see by these, these areas, various disciplines, that we as an OEM want to come alongside with our customers and help them journey and walk through that from everything from route assessments to economic feasibility to financial services, uh, charging infrastructures, probably the largest lift in this ecosystem today for customers who are considering adopting an electric school bus in their in their fleet. And then as you move through the life of the vehicle, a very important piece of this is how do you dispose of these uh, batteries when a vehicle comes to end of life? And with the uh, resources of Daimler, one of the engagements we have today is in our remanufacturing process is to begin to work on what does it look like for us to recondition or repurpose these batteries after they've been used uh, say over 10 15 years in a electric school bus application what other applications in the aftermarket can we help um, develop to put these batteries in other purpose uh, other purposes for um, providing and storing electricity. So that's a very um, long range view. And uh, we're, we are working through that with, uh, with the resources that we have at Daimler. So this kind of gives a little pictorial of, of the way maybe a school bus might be used. Uh, the day in the life of an electric school bus where the bus is in the yard in the morning and it's unplugged. Uh, it maybe take a morning route of 30 to 50 miles, uh, depending on the bell schedules for school districts. There could be multiple bell schedules. Um, and then coming back to the bus yard in the middle of the day, either having to take a charge if they need to get to their afternoon routes or not even having to take a charge, being able to run their afternoon routes and then coming home to the bus yard. Uh, in the evening and charging overnight. Uh, I will say that with uh, COVID uh, having influenced our market, uh, this probably will change uh, in the coming uh, fall with school districts. Um, you know, we're working with lots of our customers to talk about what does the impact of COVID have on their operations. And this certainly will be affected by some of the ways in which the schools will be uh, engaging in the fall. This is a brief uh, description of our vehicle, our Julie. Keep going backwards. Here we go. 
Um, we are a uh, we our C2 Julie is our electrified product. We have um, a 220 kilowatt battery capacity in it. We are a DC charge uh, architecture for our product, and uh, that is standard for the Thomas. Uh, with a DC charge, we are able to charge up to 100% of 220 kilowatts in a matter of 3.3 hours uh, using a, a DC fast charge around 60 kilowatts. Uh, we do have a two-speed transmission, an Eaton two-speed transmission in our product, uh, and that is part of the uh, platform I'll talk about next with uh, Proterra. But the two-speed transmission is something that we um, have used to gain more efficiencies in the way the vehicle operates. And we also see in the future moving from, say, a two-speed transmission up to a four-speed transmission to improve efficiency of the vehicle. We have partnered uh, with Proterra uh, Transit. Uh, Proterra is a leading the leading manufacturer of transit buses in North America with over 700 units uh, deployed and over 10 million miles of service using the same back, same technology we have in our school bus. Um, they are a vertically integrated company and we are able to use their technology in our platform by using their, their battery pack and their battery thermal management system. So it is the same um, powertrain They've operated in multiple types of uh, environments from very cold conditions up in Canada to very warm conditions in southern southwestern U.S. As Kuba mentioned, there are lots of benefits about the electric school bus, and I'll just touch on these very quickly. The fuel savings, oils, filters, belts, uh, after treatment uh, are those reduced maintenance costs. But then the approved benefits for our riders, um, for students who have, you know, some asthma or any other type of health risks uh, due to diesel protected filter emissions, things like that. Uh, the electric school bus is part of a long strategy of being able to improve um, conditions for our students as well as our drivers. So one question that may come up is how have we responded to COVID? Uh, and I got two slides here I just real briefly share with you. Um, COVID has really kind of changed our environment uh, and I think it will change the way our industry looks at uh, transporting students. Um, and these are ongoing, we don't have the answer and uh, we are collaborating with our customers to um, what I would say is spin up ideas on how to um, provide safe environments for our students to ride school buses uh, in the wake of the COVID. So social distancing and seating, uh, we are looking at ideas, coming up with ways that we might be able to, to improve on that in the school bus. We have a uh, star system for our seating that helps us to configure school buses. Uh, very important uh, rider personal protection equipment as well as driver personal protection equipment. How do we help our drivers and our students maintain social distancing and um, you know provide those types of equipment for riders? Um, sanitation and disinfecting very important to to assure our parents and our students who ride our vehicles that in today's environment we have sanitized the vehicle and disinfected the vehicle as best we can. Coming up with ideas on how to do that is a challenge and we are collaborating with the industry to, to um, come up with those ideas. And then within our plant and our operations, this has been a really big challenge for us at Thomas uh, in, the, in the last um, month and a half. We have uh, want to make sure that our employees are safe. So we've instituted temperature checking at our plant. We've been up and running now for uh, four weeks. Uh, we've improved with social density at 50% in our office. 
We've had to redesign our manufacturing processes to maintain social distancing. Uh, we we engage with some work from home for those uh, employees not directly involved with uh, manufacturing operation and a new level of plant and uh, sanitizing and disinfecting. So it has been a really big challenge, and we uh, are glad to say that we have we have met m those challenges as an organization. Um, at Thomas and our production is up and running, has been up and running for the last uh, four or five weeks now, and we we're back up to 100% capacity, but it has been a long journey to get us there. So those are some things I wanted to share with you this afternoon, and we look forward to the uh, Q&A questions uh, at the end of the seminar. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mark. And now for our third speaker, Eric Bigelow is a senior engineering consultant at the and the director of Midwest Operations, leading the CTE office in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, CTE is the Center for Transportation and the Environment, I should say. He is the senior CTE staff member responsible for many advanced transportation projects, including battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicles, and has been focused on successfully implementing zero emission transit for over 10 years. In addition, Eric leads CTE's efforts in key performance indicator reporting across CTE's portfolio of projects and is CTE's staff leader for electric school buses. Eric holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Eric. Great, thank you. And uh, I can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, so I uh, appreciate the uh, introduction and thanks for all the great background um, from uh, Kuba and Mark. Uh, so I'd like to uh, share a little bit about CT. Uh, I see that does say our, our executive director's name on there. Um, so uh, we are a, uh, a nonprofit uh, focused on um, mission of making zero emission vehicle deployments successful um, and, and as a so we, we do that as uh, functioning through a nonprofit engineering consulting and planning role um, and by by making uh, helping make zero emission vehicles successful uh, we hope to accelerate the transition to you know a real a, a zero emission future with um, you know, somehow it will be electric drive. There's certainly a few ways to get there. Um, we have uh, been uh, doing this work for, uh, I think, uh, 20, 26 years now um, and have uh, projects all over the country and um, offices. I, I mentioned I lead the office in St. Paul, Minnesota, the headquarters in Atlanta, and then also have offices in um, Berkeley, California, as well as Los Angeles. So I wanted to, uh, we have a, done a, uh, most of our projects to date in um, kind of heavy vehicle electrification by number are in the transit space. Uh, I think there's some, some parallels and uh, a number of things that are also um, quite, quite different and unique about the electric school bus world. Um, so uh, up on screen, just wanted to uh, share this to say that, you know, we have, um, in the neighborhood of, I think it's 60 to 70 active projects right now, transit agencies uh, across the country, um, and working through uh, really all phases of effectively supporting the deployment of uh, complicated, large, um, and new vehicle deployments. Um, one thing to add on here as well is the, uh, the yellow dots are what we're calling the zero emission bus planning projects and these are typically holistic assessments on trying to uh, provide long-term guidance and answers on uh, a whole number of things and this can be from emissions planning capital planning you know what is the best way what's the fastest way uh, need what will our demand charges be trying to look at that The, the question around, you know, do the vehicles run or not is, I think, uh, but the, the scale up and we'll have to plan. Oh, 
All right, so we're getting lots of uh, comments that are shared uh, with my <laughs> comment that we cannot hear you, Eric. Um, if you're able to uh, maybe mute yourself and unmute yourself again or try dialing in another way, but we are having trouble hearing you at the moment. Yeah. All right, so I think while we try to resolve Eric's audio issues, um, I'd like to maybe jump into a couple of these questions um, and hopefully we'll have time and the opportunity to circle back to the rest of your presentation, Eric. I know we're all interested in hearing what you have to say, um, but we are getting a lot of questions around total cost of ownership. So I'm wondering if maybe uh, Mark and Kuba, if, if either of you, whoever wants to jump in first, feel free, um, could comment on um, that the total cost of ownership, how you know how it pencils out, um, especially given you know the current dropping prices of of diesel today. Uh, this is good. Well, I, I just think that, you know, if you're looking at the total cost of ownership of a school bus, I think grants are going to play a big part of that. I don't necessarily think a total cost of ownership will pencil out against a diesel without grant funding opportunity. But once you uh, once you add, you know, the grants that can cover potentially what we've seen is the delta over a, a diesel bus. So essentially the district would be on the hook for uh, the price of a diesel bus. And through then after that, through the savings of maintenance and potentially if they want to participate in VDG, any VDG revenue, then we could actually see a pencil out of and uh, and, you know, even even better than the cost of, of a diesel bus. Yeah, this is Mark Kelly. I, I would agree with Kubo on that. As as we said earlier, and Kubo highlighted the 80% reduction in, in, in the overall maintenance of the vehicles um, is a long-term uh, TCO calculation that that school districts can go through. Uh, and today, the the current technology uh, price point is high, and without those subsidies. Uh, it will be difficult to pencil out an electric school bus in today's dollars. Um, I think as we begin to see uh, scalability and adoption in the market space, uh, and keep in mind that it's it's uh, not only Thomas or Bluebird or our other competitors' ability to produce electric school buses, it's the entire industry surrounding the electric vehicle production. So it's increased... Um, scalability for motors, batteries, battery management systems, and things like that to help drive down the cost so that, you know, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, those costs will continue to be driven down because the volume of electric vehicles and the scalability of electric vehicles will continue to increase. Um, and that helps drive those initial 
uh, costs down for the technology. Hi, this is Eric uh, with, with Great Apologies. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, gosh, I'm so sorry. Really uh, <laughs> switching rooms, trying to take everything to get the uh, audio to work. Apologies. Okay. Uh, all right, well, let me, I'll, I'll try and, sounds like you had a couple of questions in there. I'll try and uh, get through these slides so I can get uh, over to questions. So. Um, Excellent. So I think the only thing I guess I want to add on uh, kind of why has been covered, I think, pretty well on why electric and why now has been uh, one of the the technology has been around for a while, and uh, the batteries themselves are really the uh, I would say kind of the new linchpin that is really enabling um, the rush of vehicle electrification today with the right balance of cost, performance, energy density, uh, and all of those factors. So that's really um, you know, we're, we're, at, we're, at, we're at a really interesting uh, and kind of pivotal time in vehicle electrification. So, um, uh, okay, so just as far as we're aware, are around 400 uh, uh, electric school buses on the road today. Um, so number, uh, as we uh, we're trying to get some, some closer numbers around this, but um, the number is definitely going in the right direction. I've definitely seen more. Uh, and more vehicles getting on the road. Um, what I want to talk next is a, a bit about the, the planning process. This is, I think, something where we see a, a lot of parallel between the, the transit world and, and certainly larger uh, electric school bus deployments, uh, and that there's a, a different need for, for differing amounts of planning uh, by scale of the project. Uh, for, for adding a, a, a small number of buses to your fleet, um, uh, it, it's always good to know what you're up against, but it's also it, with a large number of vehicles, uh, you can usually find a, a way to use vehicles and use those as learning. Uh, if you're really diving in and you're making you know, really large uh, investments in infrastructure vehicles um, and all those, it, it is really important to understand and make sure from from a planning perspective, that um, that that you won't have any uh, surprises, I guess really is a way to say it. So, um, that all all of those uh, some of the things that Kuba and Mark had brought up on uh, ensuring there is enough time for charging, ensuring that you have a, a good handle on what your fuel cost will be based on what rate structure you're, you you're going to land in with your utility. Um, that any, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, I, I said they're very uh, judicious on any cost model planning. You know, what what are assumptions that you are uh, can can build on and are going to be true for for 12 years, and what are anything that are um, unsure and, and and may may shift over time. Um, so yeah, I like said really, uh, it's really looking at a different. Um, Difference by scale. So uh, I think again, it's been uh, covered a bit as well. So um, this is just as a just as a note, the charge management and vehicle to grid technology is uh, something that uh, is going to become uh, common, and that's even kind of uh, old hat in probably five or so years. Right now, there's a number of technologies out there and uh, technology providers to to make that charge happen, both to help control your costs and kind of slot the charging in and control when those happen, to help minimize your costs as well as uh, future vehicle to grid scenarios. So that's uh, coming on fast and, and the market barriers that exist today in vehicle to grid, I think are going to uh, start falling and that will be uh, become more and more of a part of the energy ecosystem. I uh, just wanted to chat quickly. We have with um, a project that we have with the Stockton Unified School District. So this was a uh, uh, almost five million dollar project as part of uh, nearly nine million dollars of funding for the uh, Stockton Unified School District. Uh, and this is to both uh, 
uh, install and gets a zero emission vehicle deployment going, but it's also uh, really doing a, a whole number of things and, and making uh, a lot of change in uh, an oven uh, population with a high percentage of um, underrepresented populations as well as uh, really significant air quality challenges. So looking to both solve the, the near and the long-term uh, planning perspective for carbon as well as, as charging strategy. Um, so happy to talk more about that. Uh, if there are any questions? And then uh, folks have uh, brought up some good funding opportunities already. And I think it's really the one I want to talk to is we're, I want to emphasize we're at, I think, a really interesting place again in, in the rush for vehicle electrification and I think things may start to move uh, quickly now and as um, as we get more buses out on the road uh, we, we really do expect to see the cost start to come down so um, getting uh, the, the future is coming fast I think in uh, in vehicle electrification uh, and then the last one I guess I'll just leave this here we've uh, just concluded a webinar series of, of our so I think there are um, these are recordings available at our website, which, which may answer some folks' questions as well. Um, so with that, I guess I'd like to uh, turn it back to Forrest. Great. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate your, your nimbleness to uh, problem solve there as well. So now I'm going to ask all the presenters to go ahead and turn on your webcams. Um, just to make this a little bit more interactive for our audience. And I'm going to try and make my way through a very long list of questions. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so the first question that I'm going to ask you all, we've had a couple sort of in the same vein, um, is related to cold weather and how that affects the range. Um, so if a couple of you could maybe comment on how cold weather is affecting range and what you're doing to um, uh, resolve some of the issues around HVAC on, on school buses, uh, especially in colder climates where this is a, a common issue. Um, yeah, this is Cuba. Um, so yeah, uh, temperature absolutely affects range. You know, th there's a certain temperature where batteries really like to function. That's like between 60 and 80 degrees. You know, so if the batteries are 60 to 80 degrees, it's not necessarily the ambient temperature. So less than 32 degrees, they really won't take a charge. Um, 40 degrees, you know, you're going to charge at about 85% capacity and it'll charge slowly. Uh, 60 to 80 is ideal, 80 to 105, again, that's getting pretty hot, so the, the batteries are charged slowly as well. And about uh, above 105, they won't necessarily take a charge as well. Um, but we do have a thermal management system that sort of tries to keep the batteries in the optimal um, temperature of, you know, 60 to 80 degrees and also uh, the rest of the components. And for cold weather, we do offer a winter package, which is essentially a battery insulation around the batteries, a third thermal management system heater, and uh, the ability to precondition the bus. So essentially, while charging, you can have the bus plugged in, and it'll be uh, warm and ready when you're ready to go on your morning route. Um, and as, and uh, we also offer, we do have an electrical um, heater, but we are also offering a fuel fire heater option for those cold, colder climates as well. Yeah, so similar to, to Kuba's comments about the batteries, uh, all the batteries have their sweet spots in terms of their temperature operating. Um, one of the, as I said earlier, our benefits that we do have uh, experience with the Proterra system to operate in multiple types of climates and very cold climates up in Canada, uh, as well as uh, some of the northern states on a very frequent basis. So um, it, it's going to be a matter how to uh, those batteries are going to perform. And we've seen great success with the Proterra uh, system operating in those colder climates, uh, and as well as being able to provide sustainable heat for the vehicle and the cab 
uh, we continue to evolve that technology and work and look for um, newer technologies coming on the market space uh, to to offer greater efficiencies for our vehicles. So that's an important ongoing um, uh, you know view for us is to find more efficient ways to uh, consume less energy yet produce the same amount of heat uh, for the vehicle as well as maintaining the battery temperatures that the vehicle needs to operate. Great, thanks to both of you. Uh, so the next question I have is um, from Charlie Alcock. Have all states authorized or certified electric school buses as an acceptable way to transport students? Um, and then sort of as a, a follow-up to this question um, for you, Mark, what markets does Julie operate in? Okay. So great question from Charlie. Um, I would say that at this point, not all states have uh, given the approval for the electric school bus. Uh, as we are introducing the vehicles, uh, one of the part of that ecosystem around the vehicle is to engage with the local um, authorities, the inspections, the DOTs for the electrification of, uh, of the vehicle and to introduce that to the state and to work hand in hand. A lot of these have been pilot projects and there's been a lot of collaboration and conversations with uh, the respective uh, DOT and inspectors, and we're very grateful for that uh, in coming up with the adoption criteria and how to inspect it. Um, in terms of uh, our product, Julie, so we, we are operating in all types of geographical uh, space as far as where we are in terms of uh, coastal climates, warmer climates. Um, we do have, uh, you know, two to uh, 20 and a, and a 10 kilowatt heater system on there uh, on the vehicle to to generate the heat so we can operate in the cold weather climates um, in the northern states and up in Canada as well as uh, in the Midwest. Great, thanks. Uh, all right, so circling back to a question that we've addressed a little bit already, but just about the upfront costs uh, about electric school buses. Can any of you all comment on the differential between um, like an electric school bus and a diesel bus? That difference is, you know, three times in the upfront cost, um, whereas for passenger vehicles, it's it's not that much of a difference. And then um, a, a question in the chat says that mass transit seems to have 45 to 60 percent um, increase in costs of, of an internal combustion engine as it compared to a battery electric. So um, can any of you comment on why school buses seem to have that largest differential? Uh, so I can take yeah, it's it's really, really. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, okay, this is this is uh, Eric at CT because on the the I think one way to look at it is on the both the transit and the school bus side, the cost differential is pretty uh, is is in the same ballpark between the diesel diesel counterpart and the electric counterpart. The difference is the transit buses start from a much higher uh, cost base point. So both of them have a two or three hundred thousand dollar upcharge for those somewhat similar sized components, um, but the base price of a school bus starts out a fair amount lower. Uh, and I think the economics on the light duty side are are fairly different because the things, the markets that light duty auto manufacturers will enter, uh, they won't sell a product until it's possible that it's purchasable um, and, and makes sense, and they can sell ten thousand of them. So I think the I think I think that's the main driver for the differential in pricing between those. Yeah, I was just going to say that also a big part of it is just the sheer amount of batteries that a bus requires versus a, a, a passenger vehicle. Uh, that is the biggest cost component uh, of the electric bus versus the diesel bus is the amount of batteries that we have in it. And in our bus, we have 14 batteries uh, that are split into two strings of seven. So 
with us, that's the big driver. And, you know, as Mark mentioned with, with scalability, you know, we hope, and, and we've seen prices come down, you know, on, on passenger vehicle batteries over the years at about 16, you know, percent a year around that, you know, so we hope that, you know, over time that the, the curve of the cost of a bus and the curve of the cost of the batteries will eventually meet and will sort of be around where diesel, diesel bus should be. So, um, but we're, you know, we're at the beginning of this technology in, in electric school buses. So, um, it's obviously a little more expensive now, and we just hope that curve just keeps on going down. Yeah, I would I would agree with um, both Kuba and Eric, and Eric might be able to kind of shed a little bit more light on that. And our experience in talking and working with Proterra is that they've been in the business of transit electric buses for, you know, 10 years now. And um, they've seen on their side, uh, you know, when their transit bus was inter introduced into the market space, the price point was 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 high. And uh, today that price point is much lower today than it was 10 years ago. So uh, an example of just the technology introduction, scalability, growth of the market uh, allows for the, for the market to absorb those high costs and pass that lower cost on with scalability to, to the customer. Great, thank you all. All right, so we are running short on time. I want to ask one final question, and those of you that haven't gotten your questions answered, um, please know that the speakers will get those questions and will hopefully be able to respond to them, as well as provide some additional resources uh, to go along with the slides. Um, but if you could just comment on sort of related to how the technology is continuing to develop around um, to bring that price down, but in addition, the range. So here's a question. The biggest pushback I receive for school bus is range. Regular route plus extracurricular pushes the range requirement past 125 miles. What is the model to increase that range? So I'll, 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 I'll take a stab at that in terms of our model for increasing range. Um, for us today, we're at 135 miles uh, estimated range, and that's you know given all the stars that align. Um, and two two major factors that are, that are we're seeing impact the range. Um, one is uh, the size of the battery density of battery. As the battery density begins to improve uh, with technology, uh, that allows the batteries to store more energy and obviously to go further. Uh, and we will see in 2021 a new density change for us and our battery technology will help us improve uh, where we are. The other piece of that is, is um, uh, efficiency of the vehicle itself, being able to uh, go further. And I think I mentioned earlier that we do have a transmission uh, today, a two-speed transmission. We're looking to go to a four-speed. Part, part of the challenge, I think, in our industry is the fact that you know, we're a school bus manufacturer and number one is safety for our students and our riders. And so we have to build and construct vehicles in a very different way than maybe the transit market or other um, mass um, bus manufacturers do. Uh, so we have lots of safety standards to meet and a lot of those safety standards, you know, result in our vehicle being a heavier vehicle um, on the road. And, and that's okay. I mean, that's what we're into. I, that's our market space. And so um, as we start to explore these new technologies, whether it's battery density, it's transmissions, it's e-axles, things like that, that help us improve that efficiency, uh, we're certainly going to explore those. Um, and I think it's going to be a recipe of uh, multiple types of ways in which we get to, uh, we're able to improve that distance on there. The other big factor is going to be driver behavior, um, you know, how the driver drives the vehicle. Those types of things will help um, uh, improve that range as well. I don't know, Kuba, you got got comments there as well. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. We, there, there's definitely a an aspect of driver training when it comes to electric buses. I mean, you can't drive them like you can a a, uh, a regular diesel bus. I mean, they have an immense amount of torque coming off the line. So, I mean, you can drain that battery pretty fast. And, and I know Thomas offers it, we offer it. So after we sell the bus, you know, we go in, we train the dealers. 
I mean, I'm sorry, we train the drivers, we train the technicians on, on technical things like that. Um, and uh, we train first responders as well to, to know, you know, that they're, they're getting this kind of bus into their environment. But as far as range, you know, our range right now is up to 120 miles. Um, you know, we, we currently have one battery uh, option. We are absolutely looking at more at battery options for next year. But we found that the about 120 mile range is, is, is a sweet spot for districts, you know, that can really cover the majority of their routes from 80, you know, around 80 percent of all all routes, 80, 90% of all routes fall within that 120 mile range. So that's sort of why we started there. But we are looking at uh, bigger battery options. But you know, that comes at a, at a larger price tag if, if you want that, that, uh, that, that extra range. So you have to figure, you know, which chargers are you going to put in? Is it going to be a DC fast charger level two, you know, that all goes into sort of, you know, planning which range bus you need and how often you need to charge it and things like that. So, um, and other things that affect the range are the, the cold. I mean, if you're running air conditioning, that's going to wear on the battery a bit. If it's really hot, you know, I mean, it's really cold and you're running the heater and it's electric heater that'll wear on the battery a bit. So it's important to look at your specific environment. And that's sort of what we do when you're interested in our buses. We come in, you know, we send you a pre-deployment questionnaire. We get a great idea of what your environment looks like, your routes, your drivers, you know, all that stuff. And we sort of put together a package that'll, uh, that this bus, you know, so this bus can run the most efficiently it can in your environment. Great. Thanks all of you. I will turn it back over to Symbiot to close this out. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Kuba. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Eric. We, uh, we will be sharing the webinar presentation and the video from this webinar after this webinar today. And if we did not get through to your questions, these are our um, speakers' emails. Um, we will also be sending a recap email where we would CC our speakers. So the conversation definitely will still be happening. Um, but via email um, rather than the webinar today. And we want to thank you all for joining us this morning. And we hope you're able to join us next next week, uh, starting June 15th, our first webinar of the Roadmap Webinar Series, Equitable Transportation Electrification, will start um, at 9 a.m., um, which is different from our regular 10 a.m. Pacific time, start time for our webinars. So keep, take note of that. And our panelists will highlight the work that their organizations are doing to bring clean mobility options, clean transportation to all communities. Um, we want to thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you on Monday, June 15th. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you.